Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Center for Vein Restoration's inaugural National CME Series. We wanted to thank you for joining us this afternoon. At this time, I would like to begin the presentation by introducing our president and CEO, Dr. Sanjeev Lockenpal, who will provide further information on our National CME Series. The next slide, please. You know, hope you're all staying safe uh, with all the COVID stuff going on. And uh, we've all been kind of cooped inside trying to do our best. Here at the Center for Vein Restoration, we've been trying to figure out how best to continue a robust exchange of ideas within our physicians here at Center for Vein Restoration, our physician partners in the community who, you know, primary care doctors, OBGYNs, podiatrists, other people who are involved with the, the treatment of venous disorders, and uh, also how to continue sharing what we have learned and learn from others within the field of phlebology. So just for those of you who are not familiar with the Center for Vein Restoration, we, are, we have the privilege of providing care within 16 states in the United States. We have over 80 centers, and most importantly, we have the privilege of taking care of over 200,000 patients a year through about 60 or 65 of our absolutely amazing providers. CBR strength comes from our providers, our physicians, our APPs, and if you look at this picture, there, is, there are just so many well-established physicians within the field of phlebology that one of the ideas that came to us was, why don't we start a national CME series, again, with the audience being our partners in the community and also fellow phlebologists who are practicing. Uh, CBR prides itself in uh, providing excellent clinical care. And excellent clinical care does not just stop at care, it also includes education and research. So we also have a fellowship program, you know, continuing education where we want to educate the next generation. Dr. Peter Pappas is our program director and you have all these other physicians that you see on the screen who assist him in providing the best possible education to six of our fellows who graduate, who will graduate next year. Right now we have four fellows. Our research and publication, we are publishing about six to 10 papers a year with all the data that we collect from the patients you send us, the patients who you trust us with. Uh, it, we feel it's our responsibility to give back by publishing. And uh, just a couple of quick reminders, please everybody keep your uh, microphones muted. Uh, be mindful of your videos. We've all been in some embarrassing situations as the videos are on. And please do submit your questions. This is gonna be a very interactive discussion. Uh, Dr. Morrison will be presenting for about 20 to 25 minutes initially. Please submit your questions. We will get to all of the questions. Some questions we'll be able to get to here today. Some <laughs> questions we will forward to your local Center for Vein Restoration provider, and then they will get back to you with the answers, but we will get to all the questions. And please do take a moment to present, a, to fill the post presentation survey so that we can continue to make this presentation better. With that, I will now uh, introduce Dr. Morrison. Again, for most of you, he needs no introduction. Doctor, can you go to the next slide, please? This is not good. Dr. Morrison, as you know, has been the past president of the American College of Phlebology. He's been the past president of the International Union of Phlebology. We are absolutely privileged to have Dr. Morrison as one of our physicians. So with that, Nick, please. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, I realize that we are, um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. All right, I will, uh, I know we're spread up across a, a number of time zones, so I'll just wish everybody a good day rather than good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the modalities for treatment of chronic venous disease. This, this, this presentation will be somewhat basic um, and we're gonna leave the, the questions till the end so uh, we can really ramp up the discussion 
at that point in time. Uh, so that picture on the on the right side of the screen is uh, right outside Phoenix. It's a place called Superstition Wilderness, and those are saguaro cactus. And I'll see if I can make this go. There we go. That's my disclosure slide. Uh, that's a place right outside of Tucson in the middle of the desert with these beautiful waterfalls. It's a wonderful place to go in the hot summer. And it is hot. It's 112 degrees today here. Um, I, I want to present some fun facts about venous disease. Mostly I just wanted to use this picture because I just love this picture. So the beginnings of venous disease can be found much earlier than you might anticipate. In a study from quite a while ago in the 1992, uh, they found that almost 20% of, of individuals 18 to 20 years old had diagnosable venous disease. And even more impressively, 2.5% of individuals 10 to 12 years old you already be able to make the sound come out of here. That's what I was thinking. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Uh, this is a study looking at eight, it, again, individuals at 65 years old, 38% of men and 31% of women were had varicose vein disease already at age 65. So it's really a prominent, common disease process. We do know that inactivity aggravates this venous disease. This is an old study, but it, it still stands uh, in this study of almost 3,000 patients, 64.5% of them had jobs that required them to stand in one place, like a uh, cashier or somebody working on an assembly line. I do want to talk a bit about venous physiology, but I don't want you to tune out because I'm going to make this brief and really fairly basic, uh, uh, and we can, we can ramp up at, at the question and answer session. So a little bit about venous physiology and the reason is it's really important to know the physiology in an individual patient so you can make an appropriate diagnosis and plan for an acceptable treatment. The two most common causes of a venous disease are obstruction of venous outflow and reflux or backward flow, which results from uh, valves that are not closing properly. So what walking results in upward flow uh, by a mechanism of the calf pump, uh, valve closure is it prevents the backward flow. So there's a cartoon of it showing a, a muscular venous compression and then upward flow through open valves. And then toward the tail end of the flow, the valves close and uh, so that the reflux does not occur. In the abnormal situation, those valves won't close completely or properly and you'll get reflux or backward flow. We all know that venous circulation uh, is designed to return blood to the heart for reoxygenation and, re and uh, recirculation. And the return is a result of that calf pump and foot pump, as well as the venous valves. So that's it for the physiology. I want to go to a little bit of venous anatomy. In leg veins, there are two venous systems, a deep and a superficial system. This is an ultrasound image of uh, some of the deep and superficial in the lower vein in the calf. Uh, that's a small saphenous vein at the top there. And that's a part of the superficial system. Those are muscular veins in the gastrocnemius muscles or soleus muscles. And then down below is the popliteal vein, which is uh, part of the uh, deep system. In the superficial system it consists of uh, tributaries and the great anterior accessory and posterior accessory saphenous veins, the small saphenous vein, and a thigh extension sometimes called the vein of Giacomini. This is an ultrasound image of a great saphenous vein in the thigh encased in this, uh, in this fascial sheath. You can see the fascial sheath here. And that's, that's important for a number of reasons and I'll go into that. And then this is an image, ultrasound image of the great saphenous vein leaving the fascia sheath and become more superficial, which it does commonly. So as I intimated, the, the anatomy of the great saphenous vein is extremely variable. Uh, and necess it's necessary to understand those variabilities to be able to do proper diagnosis and treatment. 
that's an ultrasound image again of the great saphenous vein at the junction. So on the right is the great saphenous vein entering the, uh, the femoral vein to become the common femoral vein through the terminal valve. This is a vein called the superficial epigastric vein, which becomes important to us during treatment. And I'll point that out later. And this is a small saphenous vein. So the small saphenous vein entering the popliteal vein. This is an extension of that small saphenous vein, in this case called the vein of Giacomini. This is an abnormal vein of Giacomini because it's much larger than it should be. Uh, it's, it's even larger than the small saphenous vein itself. So this is really an abnormal vein of Giacomini. A bit about the signs and symptoms of chronic venous disease. Presenting symptoms can include pain or aching such as this, leg fatigue or heaviness, muscle cramps, particularly nocturnal muscle cramps, swelling, particularly later in the day, itching, restless leg, and numbness and burning. Now, all, all of these symptoms can occur with venous disease, but they're not specific to venous disease. So even though we see all of these symptoms, it's incumbent upon us to uh, put together the patient's uh, physical presentation, their history, uh, their symptoms, and, uh, uh, and then the uh, duplex scan, and I'll show that in a second. Some of the physical si signs include these, and I'll go through these one at a time. On the left, you can see the spider veins. Those are, uh, that, that's the least uh, uh, severe portion form of the chronic venous disease. And on the right, those are reticular veins that are dilated and abnormal. And then there's something called the corona flebectasia, or blue crown in the medial or lateral aspect of the ankle. That's almost pathognomonic of underlying venous disease. And because of that, uh, the, so the classification of the severity of venous disease has been altered so that now, instead of this being part of the telangiectasia uh, classification, it's now moved up to a separate classification, um, much more, much more uh, serious. Those are varicose veins, moderate varicose veins on the left and somewhat more severe varicose veins on the right. Edema is uh, the next classification, and you can see on that right lower extremity, especially uh, considering it from behind, you can see the edema. Next is skin changes, including lipopenia, a very nice result, but the results are not, uh, not bad at all. There's typically not a lot of bruising. Blood loss is quite minimal, and uh, these small incisions heal up very nicely. I'm also often asked which is better, an ambulatory phlebectomy or sclerotherapy? Well, it really depends on what kind of veins we're talking about. For these telangiectasias and reticular veins, those are very difficult to remove. So sclerotherapy is clearly the best, uh, best option in this case. But when we get into the varicose veins like this, I will say that the ambulatory phlebectomy will lead to a much quick, quicker resolution of the patient's symptoms and the main reason that they're in the office is because of those varicose veins. So with ambulatory phlebectomy, the patient walks out and those veins are gone. If you inject those veins, you're gonna to have to uh, uh, watch the patient over a long period of time because they may well develop coagulum uh, buildup in the veins and you'll have to remove those or you'll get hyperpigmentation afterwards. Uh, possible complications of the ambulatory phlebectomy. Some patients will bleed uh, uh, through the compression uh, bandage immediately after surgery. We always uh, treat the, tell, tell the patient how to take care of that if it occurs. It's not common, but it does occur. Uh, nerve pain and infection are not very, particularly common. The advantages of phlebectomy over sclerotherapy is that it's better cosmesis. There's less morbidity, a faster recovery, and less thrombosis. However, it does require a prolonged time, uh, technical skill, and uh, not, it's not possible in some of that real damaged skin that I showed you earlier. After ambulatory phlebectomy, the patient is uh, placed in compression wraps to absorb some of the tumescent anesthesia that we've used to, to accomplish this. They restrain activity, uh, vigorous activity for a brief period of time, a few days is all. Uh, so we're moving on to another subject, but as you can see, I put these uh, slide breakers in. That's a, a salt mine in now an inactive salt mine in Krakow, Poland. 
everything that you see in that picture, with the exception of the light bulbs and the wood banisters and balustrades, that's all salt. Everything, absolutely everything is made out of salt. It's an amazing place to go see. Um, with respect to endovenous ablation, what we're doing is eliminating the vein, for, the vein from the inside. And there are a number of different methods, some of which require tumescent anesthesia, and others do not require any tumescent anesthesia. Those that do require tumescent anesthesia are radiofrequency and laser thermal ablation. The ones that don't are chemical ablation with foam, cyanoacrylate adhesive, and mechanochemical clarivain. The indications for these endovenous uh, ablation procedures are an incompetent great, small, or accessory saphenous vein, a vein of Giacomini, or cranial extension, and persistently incompetent perforators. That's a video on the right side showing the injection of this tumescent anesthesia to surround the great saphenous vein, both anteriorly and posteriorly, all the way around. The reason for that is it'll provide a heat sink so that there are no damage, there is no damage to uh, surrounding tissues. And uh, it does provide very excellent anesthesia because these uh, uh, thermal procedures are quite, uh, you're producing quite high temperatures. Now this is a laser fiber, that's the tip, and I just turned it on and you can see that the bubbles, these are steam bubbles. This, this is hot, so you know, unless you have adequate anesthesia, this is uh, not a comfortable procedure, but very comfortable with good anesthesia. It's my feeling that uh, adjunctive treatment after the thermal ablation is absolutely mandatory to completely eliminate any superficial venous insufficiency. And we especially use sclerotherapy, liquid for smaller veins and foam for the larger veins. Some of the complications of endovenous thermal ablation are paresthesia. Well, you can see them, paresthesia, phlebitis, DVT. These are all pretty uncommon, but you have to watch for them and take care of them if they, in fact, do occur. If, the, if that thermal ablation do, doesn't work, what can you do? That happens very infrequently. The, typically, the results of cl complete closure range in the 90% range. Uh, so if it doesn't work, you can repeat that if it's technically feasible. But follow-up foam sclerotherapy is really an excellent way to take care of those that have failed. This is a demonstration of the production of foam, 1 ml of detergent sclerosin, either sodium tetradecol or polydocanol is combined with 4 ml of gas, either room air or physiologic gas, and by means of a three-way stopcock, they are connected and agitated back and forth to produce this foam. So that's the foam production, very easy to do. Uh, any dirt detergent sclerosin will produce foam with this agitation method. That's called the Tassari method by uh, Lorenzo Tassari, Verona, Italy. And this is an ultrasound guided sclerotherapy session. So the patient is prone in this situation, we're gonna inject the small saphenous vein. And let me get this, uh, there it is. You can see uh, I follow the needle all the way to the target and then inject foam. The foam is an excellent contrast medium. So you can see exactly where it's injected and where it goes. Now I wanna talk about some of those methods without tumescent anesthesia. These are, are the ones that we can use, foam sclerotherapy, uh, de chemical detergent. It's uh, foam with uh, either room air or biocompatible gas. Um, it's not as effective as some of the thermal ablation, generally speaking, but it's very easy to repeat uh, because it doesn't require any tumescent anesthesia. So we like that one a lot. The risk of foam is quite low. We will see some very uncommon neurosensory adverse events that are transient in nature. And this is the manufactured foam introduced in 2014 called Verathena. It's a, the gas is a very low nitrogen CO2O2 mixture. The, the adhesive that I mentioned is the uh, venous seal. It delivers through a catheter this very small amount of adhesive along the vein. We use, generally speaking, less than 2 ml to treat an entire great saphenous vein. And the endovenous mechanical ablation, or the clara vein, this is a, a rotating wire. 
that uh, whips around and uh, destroys the endothelium. And at the same time, you inject liquid sclerosin, which will penetrate the vein wall and lead to sclerosis of that vein. So with respect to the uh, superficial veins, the, the traditional surgical methods uh, uh, and, and the uh, newer methods are generally safe but intraoperative and postoperative complications are infrequent and usually less frequently seen than with uh, this traditional surgical treatment. So with respect to superficial venous treatment, my conclusions are that unless the surgeon and the patient are committed to careful follow-up with adjunctive treatment, both the practitioner and the patient will be left with unsatisfactory results. Now I'd like to turn to uh, some of the deep vein problems particularly lower venous chronic obstruction and acute obstruction for that matter. And so I've divided these into the areas that can be affected from the inferior vena cava all the way down to the distal calf veins. And I'll go through these one at a time. Uh, for the inferior vena cava, the uh, often this will, this will be develop a post-thrombotic syndrome. Up to 50% of the patients will have this after a DVT. Those varicosities on the abdominal wall are pathognomonic of an inferior vena cava obstruction. I've pictured them there. Post-thrombotic syndrome uh, usually has leg symptoms, but they're more severe. They also have physical signs like ulcerations, lipodermatosclerotic changes. That's an image uh, taken in uh, Ecuador uh, of a circumferential ulcer. Uh, risk factors for post thrombotic syndrome are advanced age, proximal or recurrent DVT, obesity, the presence of varicosities, and non therapeutic anticoagulation. The etiology of the post thrombotic syndrome you can see this on, uh, on duplex imaging. On the left is a normal spectral uh, waveform. So with respiration, you see the uh, waxing and waning of the flow. On the right, it's continuous flow indicating that there is a proximal obstruction and that's pretty characteristic. Although I have to say it's not always present even, in, even when there is obstruction. So management of those inferior vena cable uh, problems, uh, stents are usually extended into the, uh, the inferior vena cava and distally in the femoral vein if, you, if necessary. There's something called the nutcracker syndrome that most have probably heard about. It's compression of the left renal vein between either the superior mesenteric artery and aorta or between the, the uh, aorta and the vertebral body. Management is generally surgical. You've tried uh, to add uh, stents, but it's uh, been somewhat controversial at this point in time. So it's still surgical management with transposition of that left renal vein. And another uh, entity I'm sure you've heard about is the May thinner, which is compression of the left common iliac vein here by the overlying right common iliac artery. It's uh, mostly in women. It may present as a uh, pulmonary embolus or acutely swollen leg. It also can be non-thrombotic and that'll present as just uh, left leg swelling and pain. Management uh, includes, if it's thrombosed, it includes uh, a catheter-directed thrombolysis, angioplasty, and stenting, and with the use of this IVUS, you can see that's an IVUS image, looking at how much, uh, how, uh, how, how decreased the surface area is. If it's a non-thrombotic, we use angioplasty stenting if the patient is suffi sufficiently symptomatic and unresponsive to conservative treatment and if the clinically significant lesions are identified on IVUS. Now, moving down to the iliofemoral segments, uh, the management, if the patient is unresponsive to compression, anticoagulation, and good uh, calf pump, we will treat the patient with uh, uh, stenting. Obstruction, as we found out, is more detrimental than valvular incompetence. A larger stent is uh, better and prolonged anticoagulation is probably necessary, although we're, CBR is doing some studies to evaluate that. Moving down into the leg, the femoral popliteal obstruction, uh, long-term anticoagulation, compression, and lymphedema management, skin care, physical therapy. We forget this sometimes, but it really is important 
to develop a very good cat pump mechanism. And finally, veins in the calf, the management is really not much uh, uh, unless the, nearly all the calves are occluded. Uh, compression therapy is always used, physical therapy for calf pump. Long-term anticoagulation is rarely needed unless there, he has, the patient has a, a homozygote uh, thrombophilia. Lymphedema management, usually not a problem, and skin care is usually also usually not a problem for those. So my take-home messages uh, from this, uh, as far as physiology, remember normal venous blood flow is toward the heart and abnormal is away from the heart. That's in veins, of course. For lower extremity venous anatomy, the deep end superficial systems. Superficial vein diagnosis is mostly done by duplex ultrasound, particularly with the superficial system. Venous disease treatment uh, for the deep is somewhat complicated, but is minimally invasive. Uh, superficial is relatively uncomplicated, but has to be done correctly, and it is minimally invasive. So with that, I will thank you very much for your kind attention, and I think we had one more slide. There we go. I would I'd like to introduce the next talk in, in two weeks, uh, Venus Leg Ulcers, uh, by a very gifted speaker and a great friend, Zoe Deal. Sanjeev, I'll give it back to you for questions. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for your attention. And Nick, thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. I mean, as you always do. So, guys, we have uh, some really thought-provoking questions here. The first one, I'll just take them in the order that they came. Uh, there's a question from Brad Ferris who says, uh, who's asking you, Dr. Morrison, how do you communicate to your patients the seriousness of their reflux on ultrasound and exam, and how do you tell them how quickly the procedure needs to be done? Now, uh, let me take that second part first. Uh, almost none of these are emergent procedures uh, for, for superficial venous disease. So, uh, I never take a tell a patient that they better get this done this afternoon or they're going to die of a pulmonary embolus. Um, the, it's just not necessary for most of these. They are, some of them, however, are urgent, particularly those patients have also, who have already developed uh, an ulceration. But with respect to the, the duplex ultrasound, uh, in CDR, we have uh, the technologists who guide the patient verbally through the procedure and actually show them uh, the, the images sometimes of, of what's going on. So once that, that's that been done, that, that teaching has already been done by the, uh, the technologist. And then when I see the patient, I go over that scan, show them exactly where their problems on their body, where the problems are, and then uh, develop a treatment plan that makes sense. And, and Dr. Morrison, I think we'd all totally agree with that. And for Brad Ferris, Brad, I think one of the general challenges we run into is if we try to convince the patient to get a procedure done right away, the patient is really not ready then. This is something we need to just educate the patient on. And ultimately, it's the patient's choice. If the symptoms are bad enough, they will want the procedure done, unless somebody clearly has a venous ulcer, where that's where you kind of feel it's your responsibility to push them towards the right treatment. Usually, that's really a lot of pushing is not needed. So, well, and, and, and not appropriate, uh, uh, patients will get pretty suspicious if you're pushing them to get this done right away. Um, and and it, as I said, it's just not necessary most of the time to have a, an, a, an urgent procedure done. So the next question, and uh, uh, Ricky, thank you for your response uh, to that question as well. Dr. Gitter has responded to that, but uh, Dr. Morrison would love to hear your thoughts on do you discontinue or bridge anticoagulants before phlebectomies? Um, so uh, if I'm understanding the question, it's uh, what about the use in uh, anticoagulants and maybe bridging if patients are on anticoagulation? For years, I have, uh, as a general surgery background, I have always left people on um, anticoagulation. It's, I think it's more problematic to stop and bridge than it is to leave them on. And that includes abdominal procedures that I used to do. Uh, the bleeding is, is quite controllable with careful technique and certainly with these procedures on the superficial system. 
bleeding is not that dramatically increased in somebody who is fully anticoagulated. I always warn them that they may have some, some bruising, a bit more bruising than is normal, but most of the time it's, uh, there is very little difference in the outcome. And I think Dr. Kidder is uh, responding in a very similar way. Uh, my personal feeling is when somebody's on anticoagulation, it's almost they're giving you a free pass that, uh, you, you know, your risk of developing a, an e hit or a, some kind of a thrombus post-op is less. So why miss that opportunity and continue with the anticoagulation? And again, as uh, Dr. Gitter mentions, if you've got really huge uh, venous varicosities that you're dealing with on the pubectomy side, you've got to be a little more careful. But uh, we at CVR do not typically stop anticoagulation for these uh, procedures. Next, we have a question from Peru. With, uh, see, when you have Dr. Morrison on, you got people from all over the world. That's so cool. Do you use prophylactic anticoagulation to perform ultrasound-guided form sclerotherapy? It depends on the level of risk. Um, in, in a patient who is, has an elevated level of risk, I will absolutely add uh, prophylactic uh, uh, anticoagulation. It's, um, I'm, I'm pretty quick to do that because the downside of using some of the uh, oral agents now uh, is so much less that I, I don't, I, I, I'll, I'll use those fairly quickly. Um, I've even used it on a rare occasion in a patient who is frightened to death about getting a, a, a clot, even though there are really no other risk factors and perhaps a family history. Uh, I'll even use it in that situation, but that's uncommon most of the time. Uh, uh, it just depends on the level of risk. And something again on ultrasound guided foam, Dr. Morrison from my good friend, Dr. Bedi in India. He wants to know, do you screen patients uh, planned for ultrasound guided foam for PFO routinely? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, uh, in all of the guidelines that have come out, the, it, it is recommended not to screen patients for a PFO. And for those of you who may not understand, the reason we are concerned about a PFO is uh, it, that, that represents a right to left shunt. And if you're injecting some material uh, or producing some, uh, uh, some byproducts into the venous system, if there's a right to left shunt, it can cross over to the left side. And uh, there have been, I think, a total of 13 strokes in the world literature over the last 10 years reported. So it's an extremely uncommon problem, very uncommon. But that's why we worry about it at all. And uh, uh, so, no, I don't screen ever. If somebody has had a previous uh, neurologic event following sclerotherapy, I avoid the use of foam. Although uh, in a nice study from the Verathena folks, BTG at the time, they looked at uh, 60, 80 patients, 60 of whom had a documented right to left shunt and followed those patients extremely closely. They were hospitalized. Uh, they were uh, uh, evaluated for, uh, with the MRI and uh, the cardiac enzymes, and there were no ill effects related to that. Now, you can't say that because of that, our phone that we make in the office is as safe, but it's, it, it's quite safe. So I have a question for you, Dr. Morrison. You kind of touched on that in passing, but somebody like you who is very comfortable, whether it's, uh, it's radio frequency or laser or veratina or venous seal with all the different modalities of uh, treating uh, the axial veins, how does Dr. Morrison make a decision when you look at a patient that this is the modality I'm going to use on a certain patient? If uh, it, it, it depends. So, so if the patient is um, uh, very anxious, I will probably use one of the non-tumescent methods so that I don't have to inject all that tumescent anesthesia because that, that'll, that'll really uh, make them nervous. Um, it, you can't explain that to them particularly because they don't know what tumescent anesthesia is. But in those patients that are quite anxious, I will tend to use a non-thermal. Of the non-thermals, I tend to uh, prefer for the axial veins, I tend to prefer adhesive uh, or thermal. Uh, the uh, a foam is quite effective, uh, but I have to repeat those sometimes, those patients, so I don't like to use that. 
uh, always for the axial vein. I use a tremendous amount of the manufactured Verathena foam for distal axial veins after I've thermally ablated proximally and for tributaries as well. The, the uh, Clarivine I've used in the past, I can't get the results uh, that I like with that method, so I tend not to use that as often. Thank you. Uh, I have the next question here is, would you ever use a single dose of heparin as prophylaxis for any intervention or if you use heparin, is it always extended for a longer period of time? Yeah, if you're, if you're talking about low molecular weight heparin, I would use that if, uh, if I have a contraindication to using one of the NOACs um, for the oral agents, but that's extremely uncommon uh, in terms of having, uh, for using Lovenox for prophylaxis one dose, it's been well demonstrated that that does nothing at all to uh, prevent the DVT, so it has to be over a, a seven to 10 day period to be effective at all. Yes, and, and again, we've used uh, Lovenox in the past, uh, a single dose, and then once you go back and look at the literature, you talk to your colleagues uh, on the hematology side, that's more to treat ourselves than to treat the patient. So um, I, I would completely second that, that if you're gonna treat it, you gotta treat it for a longer period of time. Uh, we have a question here, Dr. Morrison. Uh, what is the best way to address the skin changes associated with venous disease after venous treatment? Good question. Um, yeah, this if they do have skin changes uh, that, that are significant, uh, don't forget about involving your lymphedema specialist because uh, what we know now is that all edema is lymphedema. And what that means is uh, it's because the lymphatic system is responsible for re removing virtually 100% of fluid from the leg, uh, we know that some sort of venous uh, lymphatic dysfunction is at, at fault. And so uh, we'll get patients quite quickly to the lymphedema specialist, either, either before or after treatment, to get things started uh, with, with respect to those skin changes. What I also do is warn the patient that I may not make much uh, difference in uh, the skin changes once I've completed the venous treatment. And I set those expectations pretty low because I, I want a patient to understand that some of that damage is permanent and that I'm not going to correct that. And in fact, what you will see is some uh, degree of improvement afterward, but you can never predict how much. And with, uh, with respect to edema, that's, a, that's something that's very slow to improve after venous treatment. You know, one thing I would recommend here is please do use your friendly dermatologist for some of these. If you're talking about hyperpigmentation, they have these really fancy lasers these days, but you've got to find the right dermatologist who does have a special interest in the different kind of lasers out there. So no we've, we've really had a good benefit using uh, but the right person, everybody in that granddaddy thinks that they know about lasers, but you got to find the right person. Uh, Dr. Morrison, then we have a question from Randall. If you've decided on prophylactic treatment with anticoagulation, what medication do you use? How long do you use it for? Um, and what dose? Hey, typically, I'll, if I'm doing prophylactic doses, I use either a, a Pixaban or a Rivaroxaban and uh, continue it for, as I said, the seven to 10 days. I start the day before the procedure and continue it for at least a week afterwards. And the doses are prophylactic doses as opposed to therapeutic doses. Thank you. And then there's a comment here, why not just use hydroquinones for pigment? Uh, so uh, hydroquinone is, is, sometimes, uh, is sometimes effective. Um, I, 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 I'm, I, I do have trouble uh, trying to treat hyperpigmentation. Uh, hydroquinone seems to work sometimes, um, but it, it's just not consistent for me. You know, uh, we'd love to hear from you a little more in detail if that has worked for you. Um, yeah. Whatever yeah. little experience at least I have, it's not worked, but hey, we'd love to learn from you. That's what we want these forums to be for. 
Uh, Dr. Morrison, we have Sam Gupta. Um, hi, Sam, how are you? Uh, he's uh, asking us, uh, do you advise or prescribe the use of sequential compression stockings, uh, compression devices for patients for intractable edema? Any success with insurance coverage for this device? So we're talking about a, a lymphatic pump, is that right? Yep, I think so. Okay, I, I, I thought I heard stockings. Um, uh, yeah, I, I use the pumps extensively, um, but here's the problem. When you're treating patients with long-standing lymphedema, it's, it's not always, but it's not uncommon for those patients to be rather discouraged about treatment and therefore uh, not amenable to many kinds of uh, therapy. So I will, it, I always, when I see a patient for, at first time in the office, I'll ask them about a lymphedema pump if they've used one. Yeah, I have one, but uh, it's, it, it's sitting in the closet. I don't use it very much. Um, they just, they don't get the benefit of it. They don't think they get the benefit of it. And so they tend not to use it, but I, I, I still prescribe it in, in uh, conjunction with getting into that, see that lymphedema specialist. I, I, I sometimes overwhelm our, my lymphedema specialist because of uh, all the patients that we send her. Guys, that's also overall the experience in CDR. We use SCDs uh, or these pumps very, very uh, uh, commonly, very frequently, and with good results if the patient uses them. A lot of times, that's what Dr. Morrison said, they just, if they're going to sit uh, somewhere else and the patient's not going to use them, that's a different issue, but otherwise they are very, very helpful. One of the things that's been really helpful are the, uh, the um, uh, new compression devices, the, the Velcro devices. And I realize Velcro is a, a, a proprietary name, but most of them have some, some sort of that hook and eye mechanism. But those are so much easier to apply for the patient or their family. And uh, I, I use a lot of that uh, mechanism as opposed to uh, stockings. I use a lot of stockings, but for those patients who are perhaps elderly, arthritis, overweight, those, uh, those uh, compression devices can be really helpful. Any success using Hyruval? I don't know if I'm saying this right, but H-I-R-U-V-A-L for hyperpigmentation. Yeah, I've heard uh, both. I've used it in the acute situation for those patients who have bruising, uh, but for prolonged uh, hyperpigmentation, uh, I'm not sure it's all that effective. So uh, another thing, Dr. Morrison, you've been sharing some tricks with us uh, with respect to a venous seal, how to perform that procedure right, how to prevent hypersensitivity. That's uh, one of the things that people have seen. Would you like to share that with uh, the larger audience? Your sure. trick with venous seal? Sure. Um, the important thing with venous seal is pay attention to the IFU. Uh, go by, go do the procedure is that exactly as it's described. And generally speaking, the complication will be very minimal and the results will be excellent. Um, but you have to pay attention to all those little steps, being, being sure where that tip of the catheter is when you start. They have good compression at the uh, saphrofemoral junction, so you're not having glue extend and you're starting five centimeters distal. There are some people who are, I'm seeing in the literature now, particularly from Germany, who are uh, extending their treatment all very close to saphrofemoral junction, and that that always uh, worries me about the, a thrombus extension. But uh, um, the, the 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 adhesive is a really nice way to treat patients. We, however, have um, because of the the trial that we were the principal investigators for the venous seal, uh, we saw a 16% incidence of thrombophobitis. Now. We were required under the protocol to call any inflammation thrombophobitis, and in fact, usually it's a more diffuse inflammation than it is within the vein. So we typically will treat patients with anti-inflammatories before and after the, the, the treatment to try to prevent that inflammatory reaction. Thank you for that. And uh, Veratina, I think we have another five minutes to go. So any special tricks and how you use your veratina? Um, again, paying attention to those IFUs. It, it's, uh, 
it's important to to do everything that you can to keep it within the superficial system and uh, not extend uh, too much into the deep system. Although it's been shown that the any foam is inactivated very very quickly within a matter of uh, eight seconds, uh, according to Lorenzo Tassari's work. So the the stuff will be inactivated, but uh, uh, flowing into the deep system isn't helping. So being aware of where those perforators are and avoiding that area for, for injection um, or compressing that area. Uh, so the Verathena is, is a really, really good method. Um, but I, again, my results are not quite as good as they are for thermal. So I tend to use it more uh, distally. Although I have to say in the last year or two, I'm using it more for uh, proximal axial veins as well. We have a question uh, from Juan. Uh, please, which needle size, what needle size do you prefer for treating telangiectasias? 30 or 27? Yeah, uh, we use real small, 32 even. So it's either a 30 or more commonly a 32 gauge needle for the telangiectasias. Uh, are you having any insurance reimbursement issues with the use of Verathena for treating below knee GSV remnant after endovenous laser or RF treatment of the above knee segment? It, again, it depends on the insurer. Um, one, one thing about CVR is they are extremely careful and good about finding out what the insurer will pay for. And I, I avoid doing anything that, uh, that we know the insurer is unlikely to pay for so that the patients aren't, aren't stuck with a bill at the end. So uh, we're checking with those insurance regulations to be sure before we, before we even attempt to use it. And, and you know, another thing would be the logic. Why are you using two different modalities and billing for two different modalities separately? If you're treating everything in one goal, so in other words, if you're injecting Verathena for the entire GSV, then that makes sense. Uh, however, on the other hand, if initially you have no reflux in the lower part and you just have reflux in the upper part, which is leading to the symptoms, and you're treating the above knee segment and three years later, the patient now comes back with a symptomatic reflux in the lower part and you're using Verathena for that, I don't think we have any problems with it. But if we just say that we're gonna treat the above knee segment today with the radio frequency and the, bring the patient back in two weeks for a baloney segment for treatment uh, with Verathena, they will rightfully object to it. So we, we try to, if you're treating the whole vein, you treat uh, the GSV, you treat with Verathena or Venocele or whatever else you would choose. Uh, but as Dr. Morrison said, it so much depends on the pair, but the scientific logic has to be the right one too. What we've done, uh, so we started doing thermal ablation in 1999, and since that time, uh, I have only treated proximally with thermal ablation. I have not extended my treatment when it's necessary into the, the lower leg. Uh, because of that, an occasional patient that will get the disassociation from a saphenous nerve injury. So I, am, I, I have for years and years treated with thermal uh, above and then foam sclerotherapy for those uh, distal great saphenous veins or smalls that still require treatment. Well, sir, I think that takes care of all the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Dr. Morrison, and uh, thank you for the wonderful educational experience. As Dr. Morrison said, next time we have Dr. Zoe Dio, and that's going to be in two weeks on Friday, June the 12th, talking about venous leg ulcers. Uh, we'll also have a couple of uh, additional panelists, people who have treated just like here. You've heard Dr. Morrison. He's done every one of these procedures himself and not just done them, published extensively on all these uh, procedures that he's talking about. Similarly, our goal is to bring to you uh, specialists who have really done these things themselves, have clinical experience, and have published on uh, uh, the, the topics that they're going to talk about. Hope you enjoy these series and thank you for your time, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for the time.